I'm Henry Chuang. I'm Ashley Atkins. And we wanted to cover today just some basics about the landlord-tenant relationship. Um, primarily, this is going to be from the landlord's point of view, though we will cover some topics from the tenant's point of view, and we'll point that out to you. Before we get started, we have to give our disclaimer. Please realize that this is not legal advice, and this is just for informational purposes. Um, we have not established an attorney-client privilege, privilege through this, and this is just for your own education. And the disclaimer is here if you want to read it in full. I'm actually, I started with the firm in August 2015, right after I took the bar. I started as an admin, and once I passed in December, I became a full-time attorney. And I work a lot on landlord-tenant cases with Henry and also just myself. And I've gotten some experience in this area, and hopefully I'll be able to help you out today. And I'm Henry Chuang. I've been practicing since 2005. I first got admitted in Georgia where I went to undergrad in law school. And I've now since come back to California and I've been with the law offices of Peter Brewer since 2010. My primary area of practice is in lender litigation and in landlord tenant disputes and general real estate litigation. <laughs> So before you go a little bit further, we do want to announce that uh, there has been a big change at the firm. We've launched our new website. It's at www.brewerfirm.com. Uh, we're pretty proud of it. We've been working on it for a very long time. Our marketing coordinator has been super excited that we finally got it off the ground. We would recommend you to go ahead and visit it, see the changes. And more importantly, there are a lot of resources on there for you. So we've been writing blog articles and other articles for you for the past several years. And they go in detail about some of the issues that we'll discuss today and some of the issues we won't have time to cover. So if you have anything you want to look at more in depth, go ahead and go there. We do have articles about landlord tenant disputes or other real estate related issues. All right, so today's webinar, we're going to cover three main topics. Um, they're going to be about leases in general. Um, then we're going to talk about habitability. And then we'll end it on deposits. So in general for leases, when you are creating your lease, you want to do two, you want to look at two general things. Either you're going to draft your own lease or you're going to use a standard form. We typically recommend using a standard form. There are many different organizations that do provide standard forms that you can either buy or you can find them online. The one that we see most commonly is going to be the California Association of Realtors, and you'll see that at the bottom corner of the slide. Uh, the reason we recommend a standard form is because they've hired their own team of attorneys. They spend a lot of time discussing the language. And typically, the standard forms are drafted in a way that's favorable for the landlord. In addition, just as a psychological matter, many people who are reviewing leases tend not to make changes to pre-printed language and focus instead on the blanks and negotiation, negotiate that portion. Whereas if you have your own lease that you've created, they may try to negotiate a lot more issues. And so just in order to expedite the uh, negotiations and to expedite your relationship with your tenants, a standard form is a lot more useful. If you do want to create your own form, uh, we do have uh, some topics that you want to cover. And here are some of the key terms that you want to identify. So first of all, the most important one is who are going to be the occupants of the property. Um, you want to name every single occupant whether, you know, if it's going to be a family of four, you want to name all four of them. If it's going to be groups of students or friends living together, you want to write their names into the lease. Um, this we typically recommend you want to write their legal names. Uh, many people in the Bay Area do have go by nicknames, but we suggest writing their legal names and then maybe at the end put in parentheses what their nicknames are so that you can identify them just in case a dispute comes up because you want to have the correct names when, if you do need to sue them. <clears throat> in addition, when looking at the occupants, you want to put down a limit of how many people can occupy the property. So if you're going to say that there's going to be four people as the maximum occupants, you want to note that in the lease. <clears throat> the second key term you want to discuss is how much the rent's going to be and what the security deposit will be. We'll go in detail about the security deposits near the end of this uh, presentation, but the rent amount is pretty straightforward. It's the most negotiation portion, negotiated portion of the lease. And we would say you want to be clear that 
you want to know whether the rent amount includes utilities or any other side fees such as gardening or pool maintenance fees. And so you just want to have that all in there. You want to have that spelled out. Everybody should go and wear so there are no surprises. The next step you want to look at is how long is the lease going to be for? So typically most leases are going to be a year long, but that's up to you. It can be six months, it can be nine months, it can be multiple years, or it can be a month to month lease. Um, basically, you'll see on the car form and many leases that there's going to be a year long lease. And then if it continues on, there's going to be a month to month, but or you can have the option of choosing either one. But that's just something you do want to put down. You want everyone to be aware of what that lease is going to be for. Now, also, if you want to have special notice provision, you can have that in there. Uh, basically, you can have a notice that you want the tenant to provide for. If they're not going to renew, they have to give you 30 days notice. If you want to give them notices, you want to have a single point of contact. So you want an address. Uh, these days, an email address is pretty helpful. You want to have phone numbers. So you can provide the notices to each party and so that you know where it's going and they know how to contact you. And finally, um, just because this has come up a lot, is that you want to discuss pets, whether or not people are allowed to have pets, what type of pets, how many pets, if they need to contact you, if they're going to have additional pets. That's all stuff you want to put into the lease. Um, you'll see in the car form there is a section for you to fill out about that. And if you're drafting your own lease, you want to know in there saying, you know, no pets, two pets, one dog, one cat, whatever that is. <clears throat> now, another thing that you might want to add on to as to the lease is whatever house rules you may have. This is particularly important in that many uh, homes now are now in HOAs and they have their own specific rules. So you'll want to attach the HOA rules there and have a tenant sign off on it. But if you do have a duplex or a triplex or any other property that does have adjoining walls, you'll probably want to have house rules for the tenants so that you know they're courteous to other tenants. Maybe some time in which you know there's going to be quiet hours between 10 a.m. or 10 p.m. to like 6 a.m. Whatever you want to do, you know some other basic ones like parking or having clothes out, you know, hanging and dry. You just kind of want to put them there to have some general rules about what is appropriate living for. The, uh, tenants. As for the lease and how it terminates, basically if you have a fixed term lease, the lease itself will terminate on its face unless you have some specific provision that says you have to give notice. So for example, if we have a lease that started on January 1st and ends on December 31st. The lease does terminate on December 31st. Now this does change if you have a month to month lease. So if you have a month to month lease saying, you know, you wanted uh, started January 1st and they've lived there, then you have to give specific notices either 60 or 60, 30 or 60 days. And to determine that, it's pretty simple. The rule is relatively bright line. If the tenant's been there for less than a year, it's a 30 day notice. If the tenant's been there for more than a year, then it's a 60 day notice. So, you know, just see how long they've been there and give the appropriate notice to the tenant. Now, as for the lease and renewal of the lease, um, basically there's some specific laws that apply and the lease itself typically provides for this also. Under California law, if you have a fixed term lease, say that began January 1st and ended at December 31st, the lease can be renewed automatically if you continue to accept rent. So if in our situation we have a house that's rented out for $3,000 a month and you had a lease from January 1st to December 31st, if on January 1st, 2017, the landlord collects rents at $3,000, then basically the lease automatically becomes month to month at that point in time. So if you wanted to terminate in January, you would have to give 60 day notice to the tenant. Um, typically on renewing the lease, we really, really recommend that you execute a new lease every time the fixed term period ends. Basically, this is to let you think about kind of what you want to do with the property, you want to talk to the tenants, so you reach out to them because oftentimes there's not a lot of communication during the year. Um, it also helps you think about what your market rent and what the market rent is and what you want the rent amount to be. We've certainly seen situations where I think the most egregious one is that we've had a lease that expired in 1986 and it was never renewed. So we would strongly recommend against that. But um, just given the way you know the last six years have panned out. 
rents have increased pretty dramatically. And so a lot of times we see some landlords who didn't keep up. And so after five years of, you know, just letting the lease go, they decided they want to renew the lease. So then they've tried to increase the amount of the rent by 100% because they were just that far below market. And so we would say, you know, renewing the lease every year and making that as you know, your standard practice is just helpful and good business practice so that you are aware of what market rent is and kind of any terms you do want to change. Now, if there is a dispute that arises, um, there are several ways forward. The first one is going to be the three-day notice. Um, that Generally, it's going to be a three-day notice to cure or to quit. And basically, that means that you're giving the tenant three days to fix the problem. Most commonly, you'll see the failure to pay rent. So you give them a notice saying rent is due, you haven't made a payment. If you don't pay within the three days, the lease terminates and you might evict them. Other notices that you can provide would be to cure any breaches of the lease. So for example, if you have a no pets policy and they have a pet, then you can give them the three day notice. Uh, there are certain extreme cases where they are very specific to what's required, where you can give a three day notice without letting them cure. But we don't really have time to go in detail about that, but feel free to contact us if you think that's a situation that applies to you. Um, now, if you've given a three day notice and they haven't cured and they aren't moving out, what we typically recommend is trying to negotiate with the tenant. Just given the economic realities of the Bay Area and how much rent is, it's oftentimes much more economical to talk to the tenant and to offer some sort of settlement agreement with them saying that they have X days to move out and they're going to pay you X amount or you will even pay them some amount because it's just a little bit cheaper than going to the court system. Um, the court system, unfortunately, does require a lawsuit, does require the time, and there is uncertainty of going to court. <laughs> and basically, if you do go to court, it's something that's going to be known as an unlawful detainer action. And basically, that's getting trying to get possession of the property back. It is expedited, so it is a little bit faster than regular civil litigation. And you expect it to take about 30 days or approximately, but it can take longer depending on what's going on and how hard the tenant may be to serve. And so just given the realities, um, sometimes tenants are judgment proof. So even though you may be entitled to damages for, the for their failure to pay your rent, if they have no money and will never have money, your judgment doesn't really mean very much. So oftentimes that's why landlords do go forward with a settlement agreement. All right, Ashley. Yeah. So now we're gonna go into habitability and it's a big area of law, landlord tenant law, and it comes up a lot. We get a lot of calls, there's a lot of cases revolved around this type of dispute. So first, I'll start off by going over how both the court and state statute defines habitability. There's a California Supreme Court case, Green versus Superior Court from 1974, and they laid out the standard for habitability and what it is. Basically, a unit has to be fit to live in. So in other words, a unit has to be fit for human occupation and it has to comply with health and building codes that affect the tenant's health and safety. So they set a standard for what a unit has to be, and if it falls below that, it's deemed uninhabitable. Also, state statutes, statutes excuse me, set minimum requirements for what make a unit habitable, and that's really all they do. It's pretty vague. Uh, the court has a lot of discretion to determine what's a violation and what isn't, or what, made, what makes a unit habitable and what doesn't. So they really leave it up to the court to decide if a condition is substantially lacking. So more on habitability in Green versus Superior Court. Uh, they gave landlords a duty, the duty of implied warranty of habitability. Basically, they go off the standard they gave of what makes a unit habitable, and they require landlords to repair the unit. So if there's a condition that the court deems makes the unit uninhabitable, the landlord has to fix it. Uh, also, codes and statutes set minimum requirements, as I stated before. Those include water heater, plumbing, uh, dead bolt lock doors, and etc. And those requirements can be found in California Civil Code 1941.1. If you want to see a complete list, those are just some of them, uh, but they, they lay out what's the bare minimum. 
And so violations really come down to necessities and amenities. If you really want to break it down in your head, what makes a unit habitable, what makes it uninhabitable, you really have to consider uh, what would make a unit uncomfortable for a tenant uh, bare bones. So it's not necessarily uh, perfect carpet, perfect paint on the walls. It really comes down to necessities. So to give you some examples of what those include, as the civil code states, also uh, Green versus Superior Court, those include broken water heater, hole in the roof, broken heater. Those are the type of things that it would just be unreasonable for the tenant not to have working right in their unit. Uh, examples of what are amenities would be broken washer dryer, broken AC, and other aesthetic uh, conditions. Those things do make it uncomfortable to live in a unit and, and maybe, you know, complaints coming from the tenant about those, but it's not really to the level of uninhabitability for a unit. So you really got to just stick to the bare bones for that. And for the next slide, we're going to talk about into further detail of what the landlord has to do when it comes to habitability. And as I mentioned, they have a duty to repair. Something goes wrong with the unit and the tenant notifies you, you have a reasonable amount of time to respond. And how much time you have really depends on the violation. Typically it's 30 days, but case law has said that there's some conditions that may prompt quicker attention. These things are broken water heater, broken front door, uh, those type of things where it would be unreasonable for a tenant to shower with cold water, especially right now, for 30 days. So you really have to be reasonable as a landlord and take into account uh, the type of violation, type of complaint, and respond accordingly. Uh, typically 30 days, but again, just keep in mind that that can change if it's more severe. And just as the landlords have responsibilities, the tenants do as well. In order for a landlord to have a duty to repair, the tenant has to do certain things that are reasonable. They have to keep the unit clean and sanitary. They have to dispose of garbage. They have to use the gas, electrical, and plumbing correctly. You know, they can't go tear down a wall or redo the bathroom. And also another big thing, especially in the area, is the tenant has to use the unit for its purpose, uh, living. You can't open up a retail store, you can't open up a dentist's office, you have to use it for its intended, pur intended purpose. If the tenant does all those things, then the landlord has the duty to repair. If they don't, there's some argument that you know the landlord isn't required to fix those things uh, if the tenant doesn't obey their duties. So if something does go wrong and you get complaints from your tenant, if you're a tenant, you're making complaints to your landlord, uh, there are certain remedies. It really goes by severity. This first one is probably the most common and easiest for a tenant to use. If something goes wrong and what you can do is a tenant gets one month's rent and they can use that rent money to fix the repair. And they're actually allowed to do that twice per 12 month period. Uh, this works for smaller defects, you know, they can use their rent money to re uh, replace a water heater or fix the roof if it's minor enough. There are a lot of requirements for this remedy. Um, I actually wrote an article on this a couple months back and you can find it on our website at brewerfirm.com slash resources and it's just repairing the duck remedy article. And it's really element-based and fact-driven, so I really recommend you go and read that or you come talk to us because there's a lot of ways you can mess this up if you're a tenant and also if you're a landlord, uh, you need to know what the tenant is required to do before they use this remedy. Another one is withholding of rent. This is when the violation is more severe, so say uh, in the Green versus Superior Court case, is the tenant actually used this remedy because there was so much wrong with the unit and the landlord was unreasonable and didn't fix it. So, for instance, there was collapse of the ceiling in the bathroom, there was plumbing blockage and an illegal stove. 
obviously, even with Bay Area rent the way it is, two months rent would not fix all those things. So repair and deduct remedy wouldn't work. So in some cases, the tenant is actually allowed to withhold rent and not pay rent, keep that money, and they don't have a duty to repair anything. Uh, again, this one is risky. We typically see people end up in court over this remedy just because there's so many calculations on what's the value of the repair, what's actually owed by the tenant. It, it takes into account a lot of elements and either if you're a tenant or a landlord and this situation comes up, we really recommend that you seek legal counsel on this to protect yourself and also to save money in the long run. And the next one is abandonment. This is obviously the most severe and when the first two remedies don't suit the tenant's needs. Uh, this is another remedy found in Civil Code Section 1942 if you want to know more about them and what they require. Uh, if it's successfully used, the tenant actually is not responsible, responsible for any further rent and they can move out. Again, it has similar requirements as the repair and deduct remedy, which are complex, and we recommend that you seek legal counsel if you do want to learn more about these remedies uh, because they do have a lot of risks involved. So now I'm going to turn it over back to Henry, and he's going to go over uh, more detail about the deposits. Yeah, so as for the deposits, um, basically one of the key things is that because it's a deposit, it has to be refundable. So you cannot put into the lease that it's a non-refundable deposit. Um, I know other states, you're allowed to do that. California is not one of them. So just to make it clear, the reason why they're called deposits and not fees is because they are refunded to the tenant at the end of the lease if there are no deductions that are taken. Now, um, the other question is, what is the maximum deposit that you can have? And this is a pretty simple test. Basically, it's based off of how much rent you have and whether the property is furnished or not. If the property is unfurnished, like many properties are, then you can collect up to two times the amount of rent. So if, as our example earlier, if the rent monthly rent is $3,000, then you can collect $6,000 in the security deposit or basically $9,000 total for the first month's rent and two times, the, two times for the security deposit. If the property is furnished, then you're entitled to three times the monthly rent. So then you'd be entitled to another $3,000. Um, relatively straightforward, and you can kind of do that. Now, the other question we get a lot is, what is considered a security deposit? Under California law, it's pretty much almost everything, and it doesn't really matter how you classify it. If you call it a security deposit, if you call it last month's rent, that's all basically the same thing in California law, and that's all called included under the general bucket term of security deposit. California law does allow some very specific fees that can be non-refundable because they are fees and are not considered part of the security deposit, and those are the application screening fee and the tenant processing fee. Um, pretty much almost everything else besides the first month's rent is going to be probably be considered a security deposit, um, and if you have any questions, we're happy to talk to you about that. Now, Oftentimes, people ask us what you can do with the security deposit. And basically, California laws allows for four general buckets of things you can do for the security deposit. The first one is you can apply it to unpaid rent. So if the tenant failed to pay last month's rent or failed to pay some amount of rent left over, you can apply the security deposit to that unpaid rent. You can also use it to clean the unit. Um, basically, you can clean it to the condition of the property that it was when the tenant took it. You can't make it better than it was before and apply uh, what it was, but you can bring it up to where it was. And the next one is that you can repair for damages that is beyond normal wear and tear. Uh, as many of you have probably heard the phrase normal wear and tear, it's by definition ambiguous because the courts want and the legislature wants people to work it out amongst themselves. Uh, there are some specific as to you know certain things about the lifetime, like painting your carpets, we're not going to get into that, but basically they want to talk about what normal wear and tear is. So typically if you have a hole in the wall, that's not going to be normal wear and tear. But if there's some scuffing on carpet, that's probably going to be considered normal wear and tear. And then finally, if permitted, if you do have a first place and the lease allows for it, you can use a security deposit to restore, for, restore furniture or other personal property. 
um, pretty straightforward there too. It's pretty similar to the repairing of damages. Um, as for the deposit and how to return it, uh, California law is pretty specific about this. Prior to the termination of the lease, um, as we discussed earlier, we would strongly recommend that you give notice to the tenant that you don't plan on terminating or you don't plan on renewing the lease and you would send a letter hopefully 60 or 30 days beforehand. In that letter, we typically recommend that the landlord give the tenant notice, one, that the lease is not being renewed, and two, as a matter of law, you do need to let the tenant know that they're entitled to initial inspection that can take place up to two weeks before the move out date. This initial inspection is basically designed to let the tenant and to, with you to go over the tenant with what issues you have with the property and what needs to be fixed or what you will likely or you will take a deduction to repair. The reason why there's two weeks ahead of time is so the tenant can take care of these repairs and avoid any deductions with security deposits. So if you see a hole in the wall, you need to tell the tenants they should patch it, otherwise you might take it out of the security deposit. Now, once a tenant has moved out and given you possession of the property back, you have 21 days to send the security, uh, security deposit back or to send an itemized deduction statement saying, you know, here are the deductions I've taken. And so um, going over the specifics of this, uh, if you have repairs and say, you know, you've patch this hole here, you've done this, you've cleaned this portion of it, you have to give a statement that says it costs $200 to make the patch, it costs $500 to do this, et cetera, et cetera. And if anything costs more than $125, you must provide the receipt unless the tenant has waived their right to obtain that receipt. So in our situation, it was $200 and $500, you would need to get receipts for both of those. Now, this isn't true if you've done the work yourself or if one of your employees have done it because you typically wouldn't get a bill for that. But even though you don't have a bill for it, you have to include an itemized statement saying, you know, this was, we patched the hole in the wall. It took one hour of work and that's built at this rate and we use materials of this amount and you provide that statement. Um, and so just need to include that statement with <coughs> your uh, itemized statement of deductions and provide it to them. Now, some of the work may not be completed in 21 days. And so if you're not able to complete the work, then you do need to give a good faith estimate for the work you haven't quite completed. So an example, if you're making a major fix because the tenant punched a hole through the roof and it's gonna take you 30 days, if you get a bid, you can include that to the tenant and say, this is what's gonna cost and this is kind of the estimate for that. And you can include that and take the deduction as part of your security deposit um, return. Also, we would say that in the initial letter saying you're going to terminate the tenancy, you should request what the tenant's future property address is going to be so that you can send them security deposit. Also, if there's any notifications or anything else you need from them, it's just good practice to know where the tenants are moving to so you have an address just in case you may need to sue them or otherwise contact them. And generally, when you're terminating the lease, it's also a time when the tenant probably will give you that information because they do want their security deposit back. Now, if there's a dispute over the security deposit, uh, this is probably the one area of the landlord-tenant relationship that is probably the poorest handled because there isn't really a good way to do it. Effectively, the law basically says uh, you have to sue and good luck trying to work it out. And so that means the first step for most people is trying to reach an informal resolution. So if you're a tenant, this means generally writing a letter to the landlord saying, hey, the law provides you have to give it to me within 21 days, you didn't, and there are penalties that if you don't return it, and so hopefully that letter will help you get a resolution and try to get the return of the security deposit if you're entitled to it. Um, also, if many cities in this area does do provide either um, free mediation or at least subsidized mediation for landlord-tenant disputes, so if you do have a problem and you're unable to work it out on your own, you do, need, you do have some resources in the individual cities to try to work it out. Um, and they can help you try to reach a resolution and they are doing in the field because they have extensive training in trying to reach resolution. Now, if you're unable to reach a resolution, you can file a lawsuit. Uh, if your claim is for $10,000 or less, you can file in small claims court. Otherwise, you can file in general civil litigation. Um, small claims court is an expedited process and typically lawyers are not allowed, so it's much easier and it's a system set up for people representing themselves. And so that's what we typically, if you want to do that and you're positive small enough, that is generally a good, the easiest way down. 
Um, finally, as for the deposits itself and kind of what the people are entitled to. So uh, if you have a claim for a deposit, basically you're entitled to your actual damages. And so those damages would be pretty much the amount of the security deposit. Um, if you uh, have the actual damages, you can go ahead and just say, you know, this is what it is. My security deposit with $6,000, I'm entitled to that back. Now, also, if you do have a claim for bad faith saying that, you know, there was no reason the landlord was going to send you back, you know, withhold the security deposit and didn't send it back to you, you could be entitled to two times the amount of the deposit. And so you can just raise that as a claim and to say, you know, this is what I'm entitled to. I'm entitled to my initial $6,000 security deposit and then possibly two times that. And finally, depending on your lease, you may be entitled to attorney's fees. So many leases do you have an attorney fee provided for the prevailing party? And so if you do incur attorney's fees and you have to pay that out, you may be entitled to get that back if you win your lawsuit. So that's kind of our general overview of the landlord and tenant basics. And you know, in the future, if there's any specific areas you want to cover, please let us know and we'll be more than happy to try to set up another webinar on specific issues. Uh, we do write blog articles a lot of times. And if you are not on our newsletter, we would recommend going on there because we do provide specifics and more information. So, um, you know, look there if you have any questions on any specific articles or reach out to us. We are here, you know, we are lawyers and we do have information. We're willing to represent you and, you know, help discuss your issues and try to reach a resolution. And so, you know, feel free. And so that's pretty much the end of our webinar. And we're going to open up the floor for some questions. So one of the questions we had is that, um, <clears throat> If the lease ends on December 31st, should you tell them also six days in advance if you want to increase the rents? Uh, typically, we say yes. Um, we believe in general that communication with your tenant is a good thing because that uh, lets you work things out, right? So if you are planning to raise rent and the tenant wants to stay and you know they can't afford the rent but you don't give them any notice of it, they may not be able to move out and you may just have an unlawful detainer action because the tenant didn't really have other options besides of being homeless. So even though you're not really required to do that, we would say that as a good practice, you wanna keep good relationships with your tenants and you wanna give them some notice so in case they do need to find other alternative housing, they have the time to do it. So like, for example, if your lease ends on December 31st, it's a very difficult time to find housing. And realistically, if you give them two weeks notice like today, that you're not renewing the lease or you're doubling the rent or whatever, they may not be able to get out in time to actually, you know, if they want to, and you may have be, have forced litigation and incur costs that you wouldn't otherwise want to incur. Right. So I can actually take the next one. It looks like a habitability question. What is a acceptable turnaround time to get a plumber out to replace a water heater? So we actually talked about this leading up to the webinar. And it's all, it all comes down to reasonableness. As I said, in my prior slide, 30 days of cold water would definitely be unreasonable. We would probably say one to three days would be typical. Again, there's not a hard, fast line on that. But you, you really have to take into account what the tenant's going through and what they could tell the court down the line. So I would say definitely one to three days would be reasonable, but again, Things come up, it's the holiday season, it might be hard to get a plumber out, just as long as you use reasonable care and, and you get to it as quickly as you can. But definitely not 30 days on that one. Try to do it as quickly as possible. Uh, the next question that we have is, um, have any advice regarding tenants using property for Airbnb? Uh, the standard form lease in general will actually prohibit these short-term leases and it will say, you know, you can't do it you may otherwise reach an agreement to it. But what we would recommend is going to our resource library. Simon Offered, another attorney at this office, did an entire webinar on that issue. And it's a very comprehensive issue and realized that it is one that has come up and there's a lot of changing laws to address this issue. And so it's, it is a new area of law that's coming up and is coming to the head. And you'll see a lot of regulation changes. But in the resource library, there is an entire webinar on that issue. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so the next question. Once a lease has expired, how long can the month month period be extended? And when rental rates increases are done, how much advance notice must be provided? 
So for that one, um, the month to month pen tenancy period actually goes on pretty much forever as in other termination rules until you provide notice of termination. So like I said in the previous example, we had a client who had a lease that expired in 1986 and was a month to month for the next 30 years. Yeah. Um, that's very unusual and it's the longest I've personally heard about, but we've certainly heard about month to months that have gone on for four or five years because the parties never really got together to write a new lease. Um, as for the rental rate increases, that's another 60 day notice if they've been there for longer than a year. Um, but like I said, as a good general practice, if you do plan on raising the rents, we really would strongly recommend talking to the tenant. Um, communication in general is a good thing so the parties really know and can work with each other on providing what's reasonable. It's possible that the tenant may be willing to pay the new rent amount but may need a staggered time period to do so. And if you want to keep the tenant, maybe it makes sense to you know, have a small increase and then move up higher. And also there may be rent control ordinances that apply to you. So um, you do want to see if you have local rent ordinances. A lot of these rules do change because like, rent control will kick in and have specific requirements. Uh, next question. If the tenant moves out without giving notice or before required notice ends, can you apply the prorated rent a deduction to the, as a deduction to the deposit? So this is a little bit more fact specific. Typically, <clears throat> where you're going to see this come up is that the tenants will actually typically pay for the full month of rent ahead of time, right? So typically, December 1st, they will pay rent for the full month of December. And so um, unless there's some specific way where they paid only half the month rent, that really shouldn't come up as an issue. Because if, even if they move out early, if they paid all December, there's nothing to really prorate there. Um, so that's just uh, kind of as to the deposit and applying to it. But if they do owe you rent and it is part of the rent that's required, um, you, as I mentioned earlier, the security deposit can be applied towards unpaid rent. I could take a stab at this one. So as a landlord, which appliances are you required to provide? Uh, as I mentioned before, Civil Code Section 1941.1 lays out specific requirements. So the question is a little vague, but in, in terms of habitability, uh, that's really what the landlord is required to do. And those would be things like water heater, uh, HVAC, sy HVAC system for heat, AC isn't necessarily required. Uh, you need carbon monoxide detectors, smoke detectors, those are statute regulated or required to do those things. Uh, I believe you have to have deadbolt locked doors if you consider that an appliance. Uh, beyond that, it's not really clear if you they have to provide refrigerator, I think is on the line. Um, I think they leave it up to you. you. They usually provide it, but that's not in the code section as required. Um, it's really just baseline things that you would need to just live there, not necessarily enjoy it. Yeah, so if there are any specific ones that you're actually looking at, what we recommend is going ahead and contacting us and we can kind of go in detail as to specifics. As I was pointing out, a lot of this is kind of um, what, you know, as works out as guidelines for landlord tenants on habitability right. and it's ambiguous because the courts and the legal system hasn't really, doesn't really want to drill down in that much detail. Right. Uh, so the next question we have is uh, usually what is the available uh, allowable increase of rent each year, and is it according to CPI? So um, as I mentioned, it really depends on where you are. Some cities do have rent control ordinances that do limit the amount of rent increases that you can have each year, and that could be um, you know, triggered by CPI. Other cities don't, and so um, I'm going to go ahead and amend my previous answer about the notice required. Um, the notice is actually required, is gonna, be pro is gonna be dependent on the amount of rent you're increasing by. And I believe, if I recall, it's 10%. So if it's more than 10%, I think it's over. You have to give 60-day notices. And if it's less mm -hmm. than 10%, it's going to be a 30-day notice. And so, um, you know, as you can tell by that notice provision, there isn't actually a controlling amount. So you are entitled, absent rent control or some other ordinance, to raise the rent by, um, raise the rent by however much you would like to do. 
And where we typically see a large rent increase is when we have tenants who've had long-term tenant, or we have landlords who have long-term tenants and they haven't revisited the local, their leases and they haven't actually renewed it. So they just kept renewing it for multiple years at the same monthly rent. And then they've realized, say, for example, in Palo Alto in 2010 to 2016, there has been, you know, a substantial, yeah, it's a huge gap between, you know, there's been, it's not a CPI growth, it's multiple, many percents more than that. And so they've actually just haven't kept it up to date. And then they say, oh, wow, we're like 20, you know, two or three thousand dollars on the market. And then they want to raise it to that. And that's a huge jump at that time. <clears throat> And then uh, the next question we have is, how do you determine what to charge for rents? And um, that's really not a legal issue. That's one actually for you in terms of management and what you're looking for. Um, what we generally recommend is you can either talk to a realtor, realtor or somebody else with some real estate experiences in getting a rent survey done, or you can just look yourself at Craigslist and see you know, what the markets will support. Um, Typically, it's going to be depend on your situation. And so if you are looking at housing here in, the, in Palo Alto, for example, and you see houses that are going for eight or $10,000, that may be appropriate if your house is very similar. And it's something that you kind of need to look into yourself and determine, and probably most importantly, what a tenant is willing to pay. And if they're willing to pay a lot of money, then great, that's what they're willing to pay and you can collect that. If you're not, then you know it doesn't really matter what you think market rent is because no one's either in the market or no one's willing to pay it. A little bit like selling your home if you're doing that or have done that it, there's no set formula it's really trying to be competitive and getting tenants in there and keeping them and so the last question we have is um, going to be about repairs and kind of how to coordinate with the tenants uh, I'm going to re harp on what we've said earlier throughout this presentation is basically you want to talk to your tenant and leave that communication open um, we strongly recommend, um, my own personal practice is that I actually work with a tenant and have the tenant talk to the person who's coming to do the repairs directly because they're the ones who's going to have to let the person in. I mean, you can come in yourself and do it, but because I don't want to be the hands-on person and have any problems and I want to have access, it's much easier to have tenant buy-in to the repair process because typically they're the ones asking for the repairs. So if they say, you know, here are our available dates or here we're willing to coordinate, that's the easiest way forward because, you know, you, they've committed to a date, they've let the person in, you're not forcing a date upon them. Mm -hmm. But there are certain notices that you can give in order to get access if the tenant has requested repairs. And those are on our website and we have resources for them so we can go over them. And if you have specific questions, please feel free to contact us. Um, thank you guys for all attending. That's all that we have time for today. If you have any further questions, please feel free to contact us. And as I said, um, if there are any specific topics that you do want us to cover, please feel free to send that. We're looking forward to do more, doing more webinars. And you know, this was our landlord basics, so we're covering you know broad areas of topics and not going to any specific detail. But we're happy to go in further detail, and we certainly write in more detail about specific issues. Uh, once again, thank you all for coming. We really do appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, and so have a great weekend and happy holidays and happy New Year's.